We are still here at InfoSec World. Uh, I'm Paul Sidorian from Security Weekly, and I am here with no stranger to the Security Weekly show, Zane Lackey from Signal Sciences. Zane, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me again. It's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a pleasure when I get invited back somewhere. You, yeah, it's, it's and now you're you like here, here yeah. in person, you're not on a little screen in, exactly. in my studio, so it's great. So we're gonna talk about security philosophy. Awesome. Okay. So this line from a movie, shall we play a game? <laughs> oh, you didn't want to do the hacker uh, I'm sorry. But War Games is always awesome. There Let's you go. Real. There you yeah. go. You got one right. See, you would have rocked that dude. Uh, but no, we're going to talk about some, uh, not so much philosophical questions, mm -hmm. but general questions about uh, security. So what is the most common trait amongst organizations that have suffered a security breach? Hmm. Okay. So I think there's... Um, I'll tell you a couple things I've seen. One that I've seen really before a breach happens, and another trait that I've seen after a breach happens there. Um, one of the most common ones I've seen before is still this kind of legacy mindset that, oh, we have to be a major brand name for someone to want to target us. Yeah. Right? I think that for a lot of folks, they don't understand how cheap attacking has become for mm -hmm. entire sets of attackers. And so everyone can be targeted because it's so cheap to just you know, throw attacks out there and see where they land. Um, and so for a lot of organizations, they feel, oh, we're not this huge brand name, so no one's going to come after us, when the reality is everyone's getting attacked all the time. Mm -hmm. um, the other trait that I see on the other side of after organizations get a breach is the recognition that, hey, this happens, this actually happens to us, and we want to, it's not so much a huge stigma so much as how do we think about not just being in this black and white spectrum of a breach or no breach, but always in this kind of continuous, there's always some degree mm -hmm. of breach happening, how how do we detect? How do we respond even faster and really level up our security efforts continuously around that? Mm -hmm. um, what, where should you place more effort or like how do the different phases of protection, detection, or reaction yeah. play into your security program? Should you put more in protection, mm -hmm. detection, reaction, or what's your strategy in each area? I'd say if you're focusing on just one, you're going to have a bad time no matter no matter which one of those it is. Right? I think the most effective programs I've seen look at how do you take those three components and use them as a feedback loop into each other? How do mm -hmm. I put a protective control in place? Then how do I instrument it and get the detection to know when that's being bypassed or being subverted or being routed around? And how do I, through the lessons learned around my response on that, how do I change my protection and change my detection on that? And just as much of that as we can use as a feedback loop into each other, that's how we make all three more effective. I agree. Uh, does compliance hinder or enhance <laughs> security? This is a loaded question, oh, as we yeah. know. <laughs> I think you can ask any security professional that question before drinks and after drinks, and you'll get a very different answer. <laughs> um, I'd say the... The reality is that as a security professional, you try to use compliance to drive security efforts where they matter, and you try to split the two where they don't. Right? There are plenty of compliance projects where everyone knows this does not increase your security at all. And what I've found really useful on those is to be very upfront about that. And say, when I'm going to my infrastructure teams or my development teams, saying, look, I don't like this one either. This is not for security. It's in the compliance books that we have to do it. This is why we're doing it. Here's the projects we're doing for security. And here's why we're doing them for security. But drawing that distinction and not just showing up and saying, oh, we're security, you have to do this, even when you know it's just a compliance project that does not actually benefit your security, I think separating those two is how you really build that trust with the different teams. Fantastic. Uh, you want one more? Yeah, please. All right. Uh, what can we do to make certain security is a consideration mm -hmm. when implementing a new project or product or yeah. some kind of new effort in the organization? Yeah. I think in that case, what we really as security professionals need to learn is kind of the lessons of why DevOps succeeded and why mm -hmm. the move to cloud succeeded. And everyone says this as a cliche, but there is truth behind it, which is how do we become an enabler? Right? Mm -hmm. How do we not, when the rest of the organization is coming to us for projects, how do we think about making those successful? It, the first step is by showing up and saying, we're not going to scream no at you. We're not going to just outright stop this. It might be a scary project, but we're going to work with you to make it safe. And when you can build that trust from the very beginning, that's how you get, can get some of the best security well, controls. In I place. think, Zane, that the reason why DevOps mm -hmm. in the movement to cloud are successful. Mm -hmm is because they make, at the end of the day, after some work, they make yep. people's jobs easier. Exactly. Security has always, I think a lot of cases, mm -hmm. been the opposite of that. Totally. But so successful, we can say, hey, we can make your job easier. That's exactly it, right? I think there's a bunch of examples of that. But I mean, even um, 
take like, you know, take the fingerprint reader on your iPhone, right? And saying like, oh, that really increases your security over somebody not locking their device at all. Mm -hmm. um, but it's convenient, right? You don't have to remember a, a 15 digit pin to unlock your phone. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, naturally that 15 digit pin is going to be more secure. But, you know, there's this space between use of like good usability and good security often go very hand in hand. Mm -hmm. Zane Lackey, Signal Sciences, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Great to see you.